British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher went to Beijing in 1982 to negotiate with Deng Xiaoping. The Prime Minister spoke about the treaties, uh, the uh, Treaty of 1842 and the Treaty of 1860, which gave us certain areas of Hong Kong. And this didn't go down too well. Uh, Deng said that there could be no question of the Chinese allowing Britain to run the place. Um, the Chinese government couldn't face its own people if that happened. He added that if there was trouble in Hong Kong before 1997, then perhaps the Chinese would have to move in before that. And that provoked very heated exchanges. I remember during the meeting, one senior official said, this is Iron Lady meeting Iron Man. In a way, each one was involuntarily impressed by the other. Deng wasn't accustomed to dealing with someone as tough as Mrs. Thatcher. And she, for her part, was certainly daunted by him because he was someone from a quite alien uh, political uh, experience. You realize that that was the end of the line when Deng had spoken. That was it. There was no appeal. He exuded authority. For months, in discussions fraught with profound cultural differences, the English and Chinese negotiated. It won't do anyone any good if this very flourishing Hong Kong that has been built up is destroyed. It's in China's interest to keep it. It's an investor's interest the world over to keep it. Above all, it's in the interest of the people of Hong Kong to keep it. Finally, Deng Xiaoping proposed the idea of one country, two systems, and broke the impasse. China would recover Hong Kong, but the territory would keep its capitalist economic system. In 1984, Mrs. Thatcher returned to Beijing to sign the joint declaration the agreement which would return Hong Kong to China in 1997. The uh, champagne glasses clinked and the cameras rolled and uh, many nice things were said. And they reflected a mood of goodwill, genuine goodwill. The Chinese, I'm sure, felt great pride in having achieved, ensured the recovery of this bit of national territory. And Deng particularly would feel it because he was doing something that even Mao couldn't do or didn't do. For the Chinese, Deng's recovery of Hong Kong erased the last humiliating legacy of 19th century colonialism. And it signaled China's growing power as a major player on the world stage. Conservatives in the party responded to Deng's successes with mixed feelings. The money-oriented lifestyles of Hong Kong and the special economic zones went against everything their revolution stood for. Shenzhen really was different from inland areas. The young people there just wanted to get rich. They didn't care at all about the future of the country. Beijing sent people to make speeches about socialist values. But the young people wouldn't listen. They shouted that they wanted to ask questions, and they didn't want to listen to that stuff. As social controls loosened, people moved around more freely. Smuggling, profiteering, prostitution and pornography all reappeared. Hardliners blamed the rise in crime on Deng's reforms and decadent foreign influences. In 1983, Deng moved to appease the conservatives' anger. He allowed the first campaign of the post-Mao era an assault on spiritual pollution. It came very fast, with a fierce start. This upset and frightened people. Some schools asked young students to take part in the campaign. 
。那么小学生就跑回家去把父母的结婚照。Those students ran home to grab their parents' wedding photos, their mother's lipsticks or perfumes, and gave them to their teachers. 妈妈子啊，口红啊，香水啊，什么都拿出来交给。Saying they had spiritual pollution at home. 就说我们家里也有精神污染。The focus on appearance was reminiscent of the Cultural Revolution. But now people found the targets absurd. There were inspections in some army units. One soldier was discovered with a book with a picture of a foreign woman in a very low-cut dress. This picture was confiscated as spiritual pollution. But later, when people looked at it more closely, they realized it was Karl Marx's wife. There were a lot of stories like this. I think that people in the north took it more seriously than most of us in Guangdong. Maybe that reflects the difference between the north and south. Northerners thought, "Oh, you people in Guangdong, living near Hong Kong, you've been under foreign influences." Even though many Chinese did not take the campaign seriously, it frightened foreign investors. Hu Yaobang and Zhao Ziyong sensed the problem. So they issued a few instructions. For example, the movement was not to be carried out in the countryside, so it wasn't. Then they said there wasn't any spiritual pollution in the economic sphere, so it wasn't carried out there either. After a few months, the campaign fizzled out. The party redirected the movement to a major crackdown on crimes like smuggling. Thousands of criminals were arrested, quickly tried, and executed. In January 1984, Deng personally signaled that economic reform would continue. He traveled to the special economic zones in a highly publicized trip. He made up a joke which revealed how he felt. Karl Marx sits up in heaven and he's very powerful. He sees what we are doing with socialism, and he doesn't like it. So he's punished me by making me deaf. Deng was, in fact, deaf in one ear, but his point was clear. His reforms looked far more capitalist than Marxist. In a move that would transform China's coast, the government opened most of it to foreign investment. And 14 more cities were designated freewheeling special economic zones. Outside the cities, China's peasants were better off than they had ever been. By the mid-1980s, much of rural China was booming. Families farmed on their own. They earned cash selling their surplus produce. In towns throughout